What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Jenna and on this channel we break down scientific research in order to inform and educate us on how to train dogs. Today I wanted to go over this video that a follower has sent me. Uh, it's from 60 Formula and I believe the gentleman's name is Greg uh, and he was reviewing five reasons how to, uh, I guess, be an alpha. Um, and I wanted to go over this video with you. Now, I have only seen two of his five tips, uh, but from what I could tell so far, this should be fun. So let's get into it. Just in case you're having some problems, getting control of things, we're gonna teach you how to be the alpha amongst your Siberian Husky. So there's some simple strategies that you can put into play that will help you become the alpha. Number one, right? You're petting them on the head and you're saying, good boy, take your hand and put it over their muzzle just like that. You don't have to push down hard. It doesn't need to be aggressive. All you're doing to them is communicating to them in a doggy way that, hey, I'm I am the boss so just so just so you know you can't actually communicate in a doggy way dogs know that humans are not dogs just as much as we know that we're not dogs <laughs> that means that you're never going to be able to communicate as if you're a dog your body language is never going to be able to replicate what a dog would do to another dog all you can do is communicate as a human now here's the great news Dogs have been able to evolve to better understand humans as a species better than any other species has been able to evolve to date. Dogs have a ability, an innate ability, to be able to understand our facial expressions, our tone, our gestures, uh, better than any other species to date. So just use human body language. <laughs> you don't need to try to imitate dog shenanigans because the awesome thing about dogs is that they understand human shenanigans better than any other species. So just be a human. Just be a human. Go up to your dog every once in a while, pet them on the head, scratch them on the nose, and maybe put your hand around their muzzle. They will let you do it. They're not going to be upset about it. Look. So there's a difference between letting you do it and not being upset about it. Those are two different things. Letting you do it implies that the dog is being complacent. It implies that the dog is allowing it to happen, tolerating it to happen. And one of the things that I always preach is that we need to not be training for tolerance. We do not want to train for the dog to just tolerate a behavior. Why? Because tolerance wears out eventually. Tolerance is dependent on the individual's mood and it depends on a lot of things. So tolerance is very flexible. Tolerance can come and go depending on the circumstance, which is one of the reasons we don't want to train for tolerance. We want to train for enjoyment. We want the dog to enjoy the behavior, not necessarily just be letting it happen. You see how Britney Spears is just chilling there? Just put your hand. He's not even affected by it. When you put your hand around a dog's muzzle, it's just letting them know that you're the one that's in charge. You see, wild animals, this is how they communicate with one another. And if you want to research this, any of this information, you can go and look at people on YouTube who interact with wild animals like hyenas, tigers, or lions. And those people, they take the proper steps to make sure that they are the alpha in that situation. Because if you aren't the alpha with a wild animal like a lion then you're probably the prey so I'll be honest I've never had a conversation with a tiger trainer about how they train tigers uh, but I can't imagine that the tiger trainer believes that he can control a tiger uh, he is always aware <laughs> that the tiger could end his life at any moment and so their relationship is reliant on respect for one another. It's reliant on having a mutual understanding and compatibility of friendship, not authoritarianism. Let's go to tip number two. There's another place where your dogs feel extremely vulnerable and you can take advantage of that. A place where your dog feels extremely vulnerable and you can take advantage of that. 
Oh my God, guys. I mean, can you imagine saying that about another human? <laughs> like, I take advantage of my child's vulnerability and use it to my advantage to control their every move. Dude, that is like creepy, I'll be honest. <laughs> don't, don't take advantage of your dog's vulnerability. That is actually promoting insecurity in your dog. I mean, imagine like, if you're exploiting their vulnerability, if you're exploiting their insecurities, that's just gonna make them more insecure, especially with their relationship with you. This isn't an aggressive act, it's something that you do while you're petting your doggos. So while your dog is sitting there sleeping, just like Britney Spears is right now, you're gonna go up and you're gonna start petting them, right? This spot right here. Oh my God, guys, if you do that, so many dogs will redirect on you. If you go up to a, do a sleeping dog and touch them by the groin like he is here, I can't tell you how dangerous that is. Please do not do that to sleeping animals. <laughs> this is incredibly dangerous. I know so many dogs won't redirect, but many dogs will. And you are, especially if you have a child doing this, oh my gosh, please, please stop doing that. Um, it is incredibly likely that your dog could wake up and air nip and potentially bite you or your child when they do that. So uh, don't, don't go up to a sleeping dog or resting dog, particularly if they can't see you or their eyes are closed and grab them like that. That is incredibly dangerous. Don't do that. But just take your hand, kind of cup their hip muscle. I'm controlling this situation and you're learning to trust that I am not going to hurt you or do anything bad when my hand is in a spot that this dog frankly feels very vulnerable in. While this is going to establish you as the alpha, it's also going to help you build trust between you and your husky. They're gonna be able to trust you to touch them wherever and whenever, and they're not afraid or scared that you're going to hurt them or harm them. So from what I'm seeing, this is what I'm about to say is incredibly speculative. It's just based off of what I've seen thus far. Okay, but from what I've seen in this video is he is relaying information based off his own personal experiences with his own dogs. He is saying that something will desensitize and make you know your dog trust you and make your dog comfortable with you based off the fact that he has done this to his dogs and there hasn't been a negative consequence to it and his dogs seem to trust him. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's true for all dogs. I don't know how many dogs he's done this to, or he's grabbing them on the hip and by the groin and shaking them like that. Uh, but I'm sure that quantitatively, there's probably not that many dogs. Um, and I would venture to say that if he did do this to hundreds and thousands of dogs uh, to collect data from it, probably by and large, he wouldn't be building too many relationships with dogs. Uh, that is positive. Most dogs are going to view that as negative. Most dogs are not going to enjoy that. And it's certainly not going to help build a relationship. So um, I would say that this might be true for some dogs where you could do this and then the dog is just going to be adaptive and say, whatever, that doesn't matter. But I would argue that this is not a rule that applies by and large. But one thing I do insist that you implement if you wanna be the alpha, and this is tip number three, is use a low voice and a high voice when you're commanding your dogs. Now, let's say you want to get control of the situation, okay? Let's say your dogs are going out of control and they're driving you nuts. What you're gonna do is you're gonna say, hey, stop. Does it let your dog know when they're doing something correctly and when they're doing something incorrectly? A lot of people interpret it, that's right, lady. A lot of people interpret it that if you speak with a low, harsh voice, that you're being mean to your dog, but that's not necessarily true. A lot of people think if you're speaking high with a high voice, that you're being way too nice to your dog. That's also not true. If you are passionate about being the alpha amongst your Siberian Huskies, this is something that you should implement. This is interesting to me because I think what this technique is, is uh, predicated on is the idea that dogs understand tone, which is true. Dogs absolutely can tell by your high inflections or your low inflections how you're feeling. And actually they're constantly gauging your tone to indicate to them your emotion. That's absolutely true. Using inflection can give val valuable information. But it also depends on the dog's experience and the dog's personal perception. So for example, if you're speaking in a high voice and you say, hi, Fluffy, what a good boy. Um, if that's 
technically not what the dog likes, like maybe that dog doesn't respond to that high inflection, then even though you're conveying in your mind friendliness and positivity, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what the dog is receiving. Um, to their perception, it might actually be pretty confrontational that you're using that voice. And dogs like clarity. They like knowing black and white. They want to know what you want and what you don't want. And tone might help with that information, but you do need to be careful with tone because it's, again, it's not how you intend it. It's how the dog is receiving it that matters. How is your dog in taking that information and what does it mean to them, not necessarily what is your intent. On to tip number four. Tip number four is going to be standing up straight. Now I know a lot of you think this might be crazy. Standing up straight is very important. A lot of people these days, they like to slouch over. They kind of bend down and get on their dog's level. Don't do that. The more you get down on the ground and bring yourself to your Husky's level, the more you are inviting them to challenge your alpha position. Now it's fine to get down on your knees every once in a while, but when you're trying to establish who is the dominant person in the household, you need to remember standing up straight and always standing above them is what's gonna let your dogs know that you are the king. So it sounds to me like he's saying that when you have a more domineering uh, presence, that that makes you more dominant. And this is something that, um, a distinction between domineering and dominant is actually something that I read recently by Kim Bruffy. Um, this is her book right here. I, we're gonna cover it in a different video, but if you're interested, I recommend you check it out. But most importantly, this is, dis this is blurring the lines between what it means to be a leader and what it means to be an authoritarian. Uh, just because you yell and scream and make yourself big and pump up your shoulders and do whatever you need to do to pump your ego doesn't mean you're a good leader. Those are two different things. One is very much an imitation and one is more subtly in control. Think about your favorite boss. Did they have to push and shove to get what they want? Did they have to kick and scream? Did they have to stand above you when they were telling you what to do to earn your respect? Most of our favorite leaders are actually the ones that are deceivingly in control because they're more calm. They might talk with a lower voice. They might not have to use cuss words. They might not have to point fingers at you. They just look at you and say, do it. And that subtlety is almost more commanding than if you do the big stand up gesture and lean over and talk big and have a deep voice. Who are you going to have more respect for? And who, to be honest, are you more likely to listen to? You don't need to stand over a dog in order to have a role of leadership. Leadership is done through uh, how you guide your dogs, how you inform them of choices, how you um, make sure you're setting them up for success. Standing over your dog and making sure that they're always looking up at you. To be honest, if we're being completely honest, the dog is used to looking up at you anyway because they're always going to be shorter than you. You're always going to be taller than your dog and your dog knows that. <laughs> um, and even if you're sitting on the couch, the dog recognizes that you're only temporarily smaller than them and you're going to become taller when you stand up. Um, you leaning over and being oppressive is not necessary. If anything, it can be very offensive for some dogs. Crate train your doggos. Crate training is going to really help you establish your dominance because your Husky will now have their own territory in the house. And once you establish that their territory is the crate, something that you control as the alpha, this really helps set in stone that you are the one calling all the shots. I honestly didn't follow that train of thought where the crate is supposed to somehow assert dominance or show that you're the alpha. I didn't, I actually didn't follow that train of thought, I'll be honest. Um, so if anyone can clarify that for me, go for it in the comments. But I think the reason that I'm not understanding that train of thought is because Greg and I differ 
in how we want to establish our relationships with dogs. He continues to say that you want to control your husky. I just don't want that amount of control. I, why, why do I need to control my dog's every move? Why do I need to manipulate every decision my dog makes? Why can't he just think for himself? Now that doesn't mean that he can't look to you when he needs guidance. He can look to you for uh, influence on what the right decision is. Absolutely he can and he should. But to say that you are in control of your dog's every move, first of all, how exhausting is that? I mean, who, who I, I don't have time to control my own moves, <laughs> but now I'm supposed to control all my moves plus all my dog's moves? Holy moly, that's a lot of work. Uh, I, I just can't get behind that mentality. So he talks about how you want to be an effective communicator, how you want to make sure that you are a leader, that you are in a leadership role with your dog. Those are all things that I absolutely align with. Those are all things that I think are important. Uh, where we differ is really in his mentality that we need to be some sort of alpha. Um, so the reality is the alpha mentality, the idea that you need to be an alpha over your dog, uh, stems from the theory that dogs are pack animals. Now, without digressing too much, because holy moly, is that a big topic? Um, pack animal is, or the fact that dogs are pack animals, is actually a huge misnomer. Um, and it has been proven over in times that actually the right classification for dogs, for domesticated dogs in particular, is that they are social animals. The difference between a pack animal and a social animal at its fundamental core has to do with how many species are within the group. So for example, a pack is only going to be a, a group of the same species. By pure scientific definition, a pack cannot include other species. Just plain and simple. It's only one specific species. Whereas a social creature is a creature that can build relationships with other species. It is able to foster and coexist, cohabitate with other species, unlike maybe a pack animal might. The fact is that dogs are as much of wolves as you are an ape. Are there similarities between humans and apes? Absolutely. Wholeheartedly from an evolutionary standpoint, we need to understand that there are similarities between dogs and wolves, true. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to turn to wolves to inform us on how to train dogs. You would not turn to an ape to inform you on how to raise your child. So why are we turning to wolves? Well. To be honest, it's been just proven over and over and over again. But this mentality of wanting to be an alpha leader is something that resonates with humans. It is something that we like the idea that we can control a situation, that we might be able to control what happens. And I think that's what is probably the foundation of the mentality that we need to control dogs. It's not so much that we want to control another you know, being as much as it is that we want to control what happens to us. And if we can control the other beings, the other dog that lives with us, then in theory, we can control the outcomes of that. The part of being an excellent leader and being an excellent communicator and being an excellent friend is relinquishing that control. Part of being an excellent human being is knowing when to not be in control, when it is time to let someone else lead. And that is what we need to be teaching our dogs, that we need to be able to establish that they can take that leadership role when they are equipped to do it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit like. If you enjoy this content, make sure to hit subscribe. Make sure to check out some of my other videos and I'll see you guys soon.